Welcome to the Human Performance Outliers podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. At Human Performance Outliers podcast, we dive into a wide range of topics revolving around health, nutrition, and physical fitness. If you enjoy the show and wish to support us, please visit patreon.com forward slash HPO podcast. If you do not use Patreon but still wish to support us, please also consider checking out our PayPal page at paypal.me forward slash HPO pod. The link to both of those can also be found in the show notes. Finally, please consider subscribing to us on your favorite podcast listening platform. Now, on to the next topic. Last time, and uh, Graham threw a picture, his little picture. Oh, yeah. It looks, like, it looks like a Highland cattle. Is that like a Highland <laughs> animal? Highland cattle, maybe, perhaps, with the hair. Yeah, it's a, it's a Highland beef. It's, yeah, actually a, it's, a, it's actually a painting of a cow by a local artist. Looks very nice. Nice. Well, Zach, let's, we're going to just get going. I guess we're already recording. Cool. Zach, great. Yeah, Graham, I if you don't mind, I feel, you know, Phil Escott had suggested, you know, as, as, as an interesting guest, and you've kind of been able to present some of the work. I guess it would have been stuff that, like, Jack Cruz, uh, um, you know, some of the other folks with regard to light and deuterium and some of that stuff. And you, you, you said you had a very – Nice way of pre- presenting that and making it accessible because some of these guys tend to get off a little bit into tangents and they're somewhat hard to follow. And so can you give us a quick little just intro into your background real quick? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm uh, originally from the UK. I'm, I think, exactly the same age as you are, Sean. I'm 52, soon to be 53. Um, I... Uh, was uh, lucky enough to go to a pretty decent school. Uh, I come from a pretty humble background, but uh, we happen to have a pretty decent school nearby. Um, and I was educated kind of the old-fashioned way in terms of scientific logic and rhetoric, those sort of things. Um, and I almost went into uh, medicine, but I was steered away from it by, a, by an auntie of mine who, who said that I didn't have the correct bedside manner. Um, even though I, I may have had the academic ability, um, she, she quite rightly, l- luckily, she steered me away from it. And I ended up studying engineering, um, which I dropped out of, didn't complete my uh, degree. And I then ended up working in the city of London, which was just, this would be late 80s, going through the sort of boom of the, uh, of the late 80s. So I ended up basically as a, working within a, one of the largest stockbrokers where I spent the best part of 30 years uh, working in uh, equities and derivatives. Um, But I've maintained uh, an interest in science in general, biology particularly. Uh, My first wife was a nurse, so I kind of experienced the the healthcare system pretty much firsthand from her. Then I ended up living overseas, lived in Scandinavia for a while, and then lived in Spain for almost uh, 20 years. Around about the year 2001, two, I began to become a little sort of frustrated with the financial system. I felt that after so many years working within it, I should have understood it. I should be able to make money doing my own trading. I should know what the markets are going to do. But I, I somehow, there was something missing for me. So I, I investigated that um, and began to understand the uh, the sort of fiat money system, the printing of dollars, and the fact that although you may have earnings in a company that are presented in, in, in dollars, you then have a variability in the number of dollars that can be created. So you have kind of lots of moving parts. And so the whole thing, that led me to understanding gold and precious metals and their importance in a financial system and how the system in their absence could be completely rigged and manipulated. So... Once I'd been that down that rabbit hole, which was something I felt very comfortable with because it was it was my uh, my own industry, I then began to discover other rabbit holes and other areas where perhaps things were not quite as they uh, they appeared. And one of those was um, was and wellness, food, nutrition, that kind of thing. So around the time, approximately two thousand and four, um, uh, my daughter was born in Spain, and I began investigating in earnest um, issues related to health and nutrition. Also around that time, 
elderly members of my family began dying as they do of various unusual diseases. And so I, I also figured that I was coming into middle age. I had a daughter. I was more aware of my own mortality. So I decided to look much more deeply into these uh, these issues and to, with, a, with a view to understanding them with the spin that I was aware that what we had been told may not necessarily be accurate and reliable. Um, I'm very comfortable with complex systems. The stock market and financial markets in general are very, very complex systems with many moving parts um, that create individual outcomes based on a huge number of uh, variables. And so I began looking at nutrition. I came across, eventually I came across Jack Cruz and was fascinated by his take on how um, light is the fundamental driving force behind all food and in fact behind all living organisms on earth. And his stuff, uh, Jack's work is very dense. Uh, he gives the vast majority of it away for free. He gives the advice away for free. And if you want the in-depth science, the in-depth science is there. Um, so I wasn't put off by the by the complexity of it. I found him in around 2012. So I'd already been five, six years sort of on my own delving into nutrition. And then I came across his work and I've been following him ever since. Um, fascinating character. He's connected all sorts of dots across the whole scientific, uh, across various scientific genre. Um, and I eventually became so passionate about his view and his interpretation of health and how it was so lacking and how the vast majority of, of modern medicine and modern nutrition fails to understand light, water and magnetism and their impacts on, on human beings and, and on organisms in general, that I just began to understand that, or I began to feel that there was going to be a massive shift in healthcare, in the way we understand health, in the way we take care of ourselves and the way we take care of sick people. Um, combine that with the knowledge that the health systems that we have across the world are basically at breaking point financially. In the US, it's financially priced out of, out of range. And in the UK, it's taxpayer, fu fun taxpayer funded and effectively bankrupt. And so I, I decided to leave my um, career in finance, which I'd become very, very disheartened with. And I wanted to spend the rest of my working life doing something that I was genuinely passionate about. But I wasn't sure what to do. So I kind of just jumped and have spent two or three years bumbling around, gathering information, establishing contacts. Um, which is where I met Phil Escott two or three years ago. He was also, I bumped a hint into Phil on the Jack Cruz forum. Thought he was a fascinating character. Um, Realised that he was living quite just down the road from me. So I met up with him about three years ago, two and a half, three years ago. And uh, he's, he's great at bringing people together. Sort of Not even like-minded individuals, but just interesting people seem to be drawn to him. Um, and through him, I met Jeremy Ayres, Dr. Jeremy Ayres, who's, uh, who's spent 30 years in, uh, in private practice in terms of uh, um, natural healing, using natural healing modalities um, throughout the world. Inter amazingly interesting character. And we then came across another guy that, uh, whose name is Ben Hunt, uh, who had spent his time in marketing. And we... Um, we've got together and we formed this unit which we call the human unleashed. And we're, we're basically trying to share the knowledge that the four of us have collected over our lifetimes related to health and to try to present it to people in such a way that they can understand the misinformation. They can find a path through life and they can, they can peel back all the things that are, negative in today's society, whether it's food or environment, lighting, electricity, whatever you want to, want to call it. And we're trying to simplify things and explain a way um, that, that people can understand their own health and address their own health challenges to, to be the best person that they're capable of being. So that's in its early, early days. We've just got started. So I, I find, I, I, I feel like I've found a niche that I can, I can kind of explain some of the complexities of Jack Cruz in 
sort of layman's terms in a way that people can actually take hold of it, understand it and go away and, and, and make use of it. And the four of us bounce off each other very well. We have different areas of expertise and different areas of personal experience. I mean, Phil's obviously reversed a disease. Jeremy spent 30 years helping people um, reverse disease conditions. Uh, and Ben is, is a sort of self, like guy lives at home, self-sufficient, has ducks and chickens and geese and that sort of thing. And he's very, very interested in sort of preservation of the, the natural world, soil, um, ecology, that type of thing. And he's also a marketing whiz. So that's where we are at the moment. Um, so I feel like I'm, I'm now on track for the second half of my career. Um, what it will lead to, I'm not quite so sure, but I'm, I'm happy that I'm positioned on the right side of the change in healthcare, if you like. Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting to see, I mean, what you talk about, is, you know, with the healthcare system, you know, maybe not being sustainable. I mean, certainly we see a tremendous amount of resources, financial resources and otherwise being thrown at this healthcare system. And again, I'm, I'm largely speaking about the U.S. system, but we see parallels, you know, throughout the world. Uh, and the results are just not particularly compelling. I mean, the more money we spend, the, the, the less healthy the population seems to get. So there's something, you know, it seems like we're just, we're just, you know, going about it in the wrong way. And it's interesting to see all these different alternative thoughts on, on what we should do. And, you know, obviously I'm in the camp that I think we need to change, you know, our, our nutrition quite a bit. And I think that's a big role and we need to change our emphasis on the prevention. Um, but let's, um, just by the way, I want to know when your birthday is, just out of curiosity, because mine's January 10th. I'll be 53. Where, where are you going to be? Not far off, 18th of January. January, so I got you by eight days, all right. <laughs> and I think, if, if I'm not mistaken, you'll be in Spain later this in, in May for a conference that I'm, I'll be attending, so I'll get to meet you in person, so I look forward to that. Yeah, um, let's talk a little bit, touch a little bit about, because some of the things you talked about, magnetism, water, and light, and, you know, most people uh, would – you know, I mean, I guess most people say, yeah, they probably have some some effect on us. But I mean, talk about how impactful they truly are, and and what what causes you to think so, or maybe what Jack Cruz why he thinks so, and maybe kind of start to again in layman's terms, because I mean, to be honest with this, this is not something I've given a lot of thought to. I mean, uh, but I'm I'm certainly open to the suggestion that uh, you know there are there are a lot of other things that impact us. So, so let's just start with uh, I mean, wherever you want to start, and then we can kind of go from there. Okay. Um, well, I think the, 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 the current medical paradigm, which has been in existence for approximately 100 years, is basically a biochemical, um, physical view of the human body. It's very mechanistic. And it's similar in terms of when, when you learn chemistry at school and you learn you have a molecule and you represent that by a little ball and that ball has a stick which connects to another round molecule which uh, another round atom by another stick and it's kind of this this idea of a fixed molecule which is kind of rigged together by plastic stick um and the idea is that one molecule connects to another physically and that's how it's graphically represented to you and that's what you learn but what we've known and what certainly the russians have known uh, this a lot of the data that Cruz went into was russian work from the early um 20th century that everything is vibrating constantly, everything interacts electromagnetically, um, and light is the ultimate, specifically sunlight, is the ultimate energy source for any form of life on Earth. Whatever, whatever your belief is in terms of how we came about, the driving force is you call, you call the sunlight God, if you like, but it doesn't really matter. The issue is that... Uh, if you're a living creature on Earth, however you came to be where you are today, if you go back millions of years, you were a basic creature which could only respond to the change in energy, which was driven by the rising and the setting of the sun. So you could, you could uh, if you imagined uh, something on Earth, the sun would rise, it would be illuminated by sunlight. The sun sets and it's in darkness. So from a systems point of view, you kind of you have an on switch and an off switch. And so building on that, you can then create layers of complexity as the, the sun rises in the sky, it, it, the, uh, the emission spectra that arrives on Earth 
starts off in the morning with is red and red infrared and blue light. As the sun rises higher in the sky, you get ultraviolet A. You then get ultraviolet B as long as you're in the summertime. You then get the uh, lack of ultraviolet B, the lack of ultraviolet A, and you go into the sunset period. So you have all these potential triggers which are on-off switches. Uh, if you imagine you're, you're trying to create some kind of computer program and you, you want triggers that can that can that can run little twitches, you can see how this, the uh, an organism might develop a way of sensing these changes in the energy input to adjust to its own environment or the environment that it finds itself in. Um, and we are just, we're a collection of, we're an incredibly complex collection of all these individual um, organisms. And so what Bruce goes into in great detail is the importance of the mitochondria, which we all learn of as uh, the powerhouse of the cell. That's, what, that's how everybody learns it. But his view is more that the, the mitochondria are designed to be sensors for our environment. They, they take in any signals electromagnetically. They take in electricity, magnetism, and light. Light, of course, is a form of it's an electromagnetic wave. And so we have in our body uh, a system to produce energy, and we can fine tune the way that system produces its energy based on the inputs from our environment. So the mitochondria are designed to constantly sense, react, and change shape, change emissions in terms of how many reactive oxygen species they give off, how much energy flow, and everything's quantized in terms of the energy input, the energy flow, the oxygen uh, consumption, and the reactive oxygen species that are produced as, as, as messengers. And so if you, if you take that view of your mitochondria are the driving force in how you generate your energy and how you use it, and your mitochondria are, if you like, they are the sort of operating system that we run on. We have a, a wiring diagram, which is genetic from our mothers and fathers, and we have a, an operating system which kind of uses the wiring diagram according to it, uh, according to micro adjustments that, that every single mitochondria in, in the body systems will uh, will be able to make. And so you have a you have a situation where light triggers changes in mitochondrial function. Mitochondria produce light. They use light, they release light, they control light, and that light triggers photoreceptors within every cell and within every organ within every organ system. The light is then, if you think of light as a vibration, um, the light causes the water to change. This is where we get into Gerald, uh, Gerald Pollock's work of the fourth phase of water. So water in confined spaces, if you shine light of certain frequencies on water, the water will change its structure, the hydrogen bonds will twist and adjust, and, and the water can become more compact, it can absorb the energy. That energy is then stored and can be released and used by the cell. So what this explains is how um, our understanding of how cells work in terms of the biochemistry is lacking because the, the energy component of every single reaction is not well um, accounted for in the traditional biochemistry view of, of, of how we operate. Whereas if you begin to use light and water, light being the energy and the water being the sort of storage medium, you can then see how we can accumulate energy using water as a, as a battery, as a sort of kind of capacitor in our, in our cells. Um, and this energy which is stored in every single structure of every single cell within your body and the trillions of mitochondria that are within them, we can then release the energy as and when we need it for any given uh, biochemical process that needs to take place. And when you, you come to a, a figure of something like 100,000 biochemical reactions are taking place every second in every cell, which is an incredible amount of complexity, and only something with the speed and control of light 
could possibly organise that number of biochemical reactions in an orderly fashion um, in, in such a complex scenario. I was trying to be simple there, but I <laughs> probably wasn't. <laughs> well, I but think it, that one yeah. of the interesting things I'm thinking of as you're kind of describing this is just like, for one, I think like myself included, a lot of people don't put a whole lot of thought into kind of why our circadian rhythms behave the way they do. Like, well, wh why is it that we kind of by default tend to be sleepier at night and more wide awake in the middle of the day versus it just being the reverse? And I think some people maybe even simplified the point where, well, it makes sense because it's light out so I can see better. And I think mm -hmm. there's, there's some truth to that from a very simplistic viewpoint, but when you describe some of the, the processes that take place, even from the variance of like the early morning uh, response to light versus the middle of the day to the evening, it starts to kind of shed a light on kind of how many variables are included when we're looking at just like overall health and energy levels. And uh, I can't help but think it's like, some of these things are so complex we tend to compartmentalize them in order to be able to do deep dives. But then we kind of remove ourselves from how these singular complex interactions also combine with one another. And it's almost like we need one, one group or person who can kind of mentally keep track of all this stuff all at once and say, this is how this is interacting with that and everything else. And um, it, it's just kind of a, I don't know if it's, so complicated that it's daunting or if it's so complicated that we almost need like artificial intelligence to manage it all. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. I mean, we, the, the great thing about it is that we, we don't have to understand it um, because we're built to do it innately. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to the era, to the times of pre electricity, uh, which is only 150 years ago, which is the blink of an eye in evolutionary terms, we would have been forced to live by when the sun rose, we got up, we were active, we did stuff, we got chased by lions, we hunted, we injured ourselves, we stressed ourselves, we did what we did, and we ate. And then when the sun goes down, that's it for the day. I mean, you retire to your cave or your dwelling, whatever, and you have total darkness and total electromagnetic silence. Um, it's also worth mentioning that when the sun goes down, the level of magnetism from the Earth actually increases. So when, when the sun's on the other side of the planet, the, the side that's in the shade has an increased uh, magnetic field. And our cells or our mitochondria sense that. Um, and so we have effectively, as humans, we have two programs. We have the daytime, go and face the world, get stressed, get injured, do your shit. And then we have the nighttime, repair the damage in the dark, get cold, burn your fat to produce the heat that keeps you warm. That burning of the fat creates infrared light, which is the heat. Uh, the infrared light, when it shines on your cells, uh, on, when infrared, light, infrared light shines on the cell water, it causes the cell water to contract, thereby making everything significantly more efficient. All, all the moving parts become closer together. So then you get increased levels of electron tunneling. So although you may have no light coming in from the sunlight, so you've got no external energy coming in, and you're using your own energy. The lack of energy from the sun at night is compensated by the fact that you're cold and in the dark. You're in your nighttime program, and the release of the infrared from your cells causes everything to shrink, and it basically causes what little energy you've got flowing to be able to do more work because of the fact that the electrons don't have to go one at a time, they can tunnel. I mean, this is where you get into quantum physics in terms of electrons appear to be in, this, in two places at the same time. And it, this is where it gets a little spooky. But basically, a, a semiconductor um, will work. Our, our cells are basically set up as semiconductors. So the current of flow in a semiconductor runs better uh, in the cold, and it, the cell water contracts when you shine infrared light on it. And so you get this increased efficiency at night and you get repairs, repair programs which are built into us using melatonin as the fundamental 
uh, sort of driving chemical. Um, and these repair programs will only take place in the absence of light. It's been discovered that it's not just the absence of any light, it's the absence of blue light. Um, and, and this takes us back to fairly recent discovery of um, photo sensors that we have. Um, I think it was around about early 2000s. It was discovered that we have a third um, receptor in our eyes. We all learned about rods and cones in our eyes when we were doing biology at school. <clears throat> and then a, a detector, which was called melanoxin, was discovered in our eyes in uh, the early 2000s. And melanopsin is, it's got nothing to do with your, your vision. It's a detector, it's in your uh, retina, and it's precisely tuned to blue light. And it's basically an on-off switch. So when this receptor gets hit by blue light in the morning from the sunlight, it triggers your daytime program. When the receptor senses that the blue light has disappeared at sunset, or just after sunset, which is your program to the nighttime uh, regenerate, rest and repair program. Um, and it's later been discovered that we have melanoptin receptors in our arterioles and in our subcutaneous fat um, all over our body. So these are developments which have literally occurred in the last 15 years. Um, therefore, they're not yet in the medical books. They're being discussed. There's plenty of, uh, of scientific documented evidence of them and people running tests and all sorts of things, but they're not yet included in uh, medical training, which means that and, and neither are they included in, in um, ophthalmology training. And so we have a situation where with this receptor, which is so important that it triggers our daytime and our nighttime programs to switch on and off, and it's triggered by blue light. And it turns out the electricity, the electric lights that we're using in the modern world are very, very heavily focused in the blue range. So the screens that we're looking at now, the LED lights, which have become commonplace, have a huge peak right in the middle of the blue frequency which is exactly what triggers our melanopsin to tell us it's daytime. So if you begin to realize the effects that we've had in the last hundred years by introducing lighting at night, we have completely screwed with our circadian rhythm. Because if you're looking at one of these screens after dark, or you've got your LED lights on, or you're watching your TV, your eyes and your skin sense that it's the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which totally screws up your sleep and any regeneration and repair programs. Yeah, no, what you just said, I was, you kind of preempted my next question because I think like, uh, I quite like the concept of uh, intuition. And I think it's like, it makes perfect sense that when you have systems that are as complex as we're finding out some of these things are, that there would be things that you would kind of just do by default in, in, in the average environment uh, without having to actually think through exactly what's going on. And uh, what you mentioned at the end there, like, you know, modern society, we've essentially kind of created a few roadblocks in terms of being able to trust our intuition to a degree. If we're just kind of going about day-to-day -day life as the, the average person probably would in modern society. So like what, what are, other than like the nighttime stuff where we're introducing LED lights, computer screens and TV screens and things when we should be kind of being phasing into that blue light phase a little more. Um, what are some other things that are potentially blocking us from being able to kind of intuitively go about our circadian rhythm? Um, well, I think it, it goes beyond circadian rhythm. It, it's uh, it's our, our ability. We need to have an ability to sense our environment and our bodies are designed to to look for inputs, changes, um, and trends, our, especially our brains are, are designed to try to spot trends and, and, and um, repetition. And so you have a situation where here I am in, in Northern England in, uh, in the autumn. So my body, if I was, if we're talking ancestrally, I'd be naked, barefoot, wandering around during the day, trying to catch an animal. My body would, be cold it would have to generate its own heat um i would be in touch with the earth i'd be sensing the magnetism 
I'd be sensing the light from the sun. My body would be aware of the absence of ultraviolet light because I'm at quite a high latitude. So we have no ultraviolet this time of year. And so my body would, would build a picture of it's cold, it's relatively dark, the sunrise occurs quite late, the sunset is quite early, the ultraviolet is absence. So my, my body would figure out that we're based on historical records which your body has built into its DNA, let's say. Um, I'm probably at this location on Earth and I should expect to find this type of food in my environment. And so if I eat a banana, my body's going to go like, okay, we're kind of set up for cold, dark, lack of ultraviolet. We should be finding some beef or some fish or something like that. And then I throw a banana in the mix. The banana was grown in tropical sunlight. When the banana breaks down in my, in my gut, the energy from the sun, which was originally used to create the sugar in the banana, was a very high energy ultraviolet source on the equator. When that banana breaks down in my gut, it releases the light which was originally used to create it. So I expose my gut lining, as you know if it's called the lumen, um, the bacteria that break down everything in my gut, they release the light, the lumen detects the light. So there's a kind of light. When you eat food, it releases the light was originally used to, to create it. So if you're cold and dark at this time of year in Northern England and you throw in some tropical fruit, you get a mismatch in your body. Your body's trying to build an idea of where we are and how, they should, how the mitochondria should be set up to, to run most efficiently. And it needs the the highest fidelity of signal it needs the best possible information input and so if i start eating natural i've got sheep in the in the field behind me if i go and kill one of the sheep and eat one of those and i'm cold and it's dark then everything kind of matches my body my body's happy that here i am in this particular situation and we have a program to deal to deal with that that's how we have lived historically so everything's good if i start doing shit like putting thick coats on uh, putting the heating on staying in the house, I don't get the signal from the sun, so my body can't figure out what the hell's going on, and I start eating imported uh, food that wouldn't grow around here at the moment, I confuse my body. And then it's out of, it, the inputs are conflicting, so the signal that my body's able to take out of, of that information is less useful and of a less high fidelity in terms of its information to, uh, to how my body should be functioning. Now for a word from our sponsors. This episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast is brought to you by X3 Bar. The X3 Bar puts a new spin on banded workouts. Historically, bands have been supplementary or inadequate for true heavy lifting. Dr. Jakish has brought a product to market that has the convenience of bands, but with the option to provide the resistance of heavy free weights. The X3 Bar has four custom bands, with the thickest one being engineered to sport over 500 pounds of resistance. The bar is designed to rotate as you move through the full range of motion. All this is anchored to the ground on a small standing plank. The design allows progressive resistance throughout the lift, which more evenly distributes the lift's difficulty through the full range of motion. Personally, I've been using this both at home and when traveling on the road, it fits nicely into a rolling duffel and takes just a few seconds to set up. Sean has been using it for both core lifts and supplementary lifts. Dr. Jakish includes a training plan along with a detailed description of how to use the X3 bar for quick full body workouts. For a deep dive into the science, check out our episode 131 with Dr. Jakish. He also has loads of information on his website, which is x3bar.com. That's the letter X number three bar.com. If interested in purchasing an X3 bar, take advantage of our promo code 50X3 for $50 off your purchase. Link and code can be found in the show notes. Now, back to the show. Hey, Grant, let me, let me just interject and interrupt for a moment. So, I mean, you know, when you say that, uh, you know, I eat a banana, which is from a tropical region, and the, and the light energy that goes into developing 
you know, the sugar or whatever component of the banana we're concerned about is now being, you know, kind of reintroduced into our body and that our gut has detectors within, within the lumen of the gut, within the actual lumen of the gut. And I don't know what those detectors would be. And are we talking about photons of energy, which, which we think about light, or is it just energy in general? Uh, that's a little confusing to me. Okay. Can, can you maybe, I mean, what are the, what are the, what are the known light detectors in, in the lumen of the gut? Are they melanopsin things like we have? On, you know, it's uh, melanopsin again. Um, I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, as we look at the embryology on how a human being forms, we see that, you know, we, ha we're, we're, we start out sing you know, single cell, multi-cell, and then some of that involutes on itself. And so you, you potentially have that, you know, our gut is basically outside of our body. Most people don't realize that the lining of our gut is external to our body. So it's actually an external sort of thing, but it's just, you know, now it's, we, we've kind of built ourselves around that this giant long 30 foot long tube of digestive tract or whatever it is that we have. And so, uh, so I'm just wondering, you know, specifically what those receptors are. How do we, how do we verify this? Is, is there some sort of data that verifies what you're saying is, 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 has been tested? Well, to, just to take a step back, uh, if I may, if you think of photosynthesis as being the root of all food, on the planet because we either sunlight is turned into sugars and uh, um, plant oils in plants themselves and then animals eat the plants and then we eat the animals but the, the root cause or the, 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 the root origin of all food on earth is photosynthesis and so what our mitochondria do is if you look at photosynthesis it's we take carbon from carbon dioxide in the air, we combine it with hydrogen from water, which the plant has pulled up through its roots, and we use energy from the sun to move one of the electrons to cause a, hydro, um, to cause, to cause a carbohydrate to be created. So that process requires energy from the sun. That energy is then captured in the resulting carbohydrate. That carbohydrate, when it gets into our mitochondria, the carbohydrate is broken down into its individual components so that the, the bonds which hold it together break down. And our mitochondria effectively reverses the process of photosynthesis. So our mitochondria produces energy in the form of ATP, uh, to keep it simple, um, it produces water and it produces carbon dioxide, which we breathe out. And so when the energy is, uh, when, when the energy from, from those bonds in the carbohydrate are released, a photon of light is also released. And that photon corresponds to the light from the sun, which was used when the molecule was originally created in the plant leaf. And, and like I said, the receptors in the gut, they are, I assume that's this melanopsin again, is that, is that what we're looking at? That's correct. So you have uh, in the gut, as you correctly point out, the, the, the gut lining is part of our body. It's basically our skin. It's, it's, our, uh, it's a tube which is part of our, our, our body. What's within the tube is a colony of bacteria. Um, and the bacteria are not technically part of us. They are foreign to us and they just happen to live within us. And the bacteria are the ones that break down the foodstuffs into their constituent components for them to be absorbed into the body. But bacteria release something like 5,000 times as much light as, as, uh, as human cells do. But bacteria are not good at handling light they, they process the energy from the food and they, the bacteria themselves live on the food and they survive, but they produce, they release the excess light that they're unable to control, the less complex organisms. And so that light is a signature from your, it's a combination of the food you eat and the colony of gut bacteria that you have will release a sort of signature light, which your lumen then senses, which is a way of, your body quickly understanding what you have consumed and what you're about to um, pass into your bloodstream. 
there's a sort of, I believe it's called quorum sensing. So when it comes to uh, sort of nutrition, I mean, it sounds like you're saying there's a mismatch between where you are uh, on a, you know, a light environment, if you will, maybe based on latitude. And then if we're eating foods from the equator when we're living in the, you know, temperate zones or the polar zones or whatever, the, you know, the, we're, we're, we're causing problems. So would, would it be fair to say that if you are currently in a, in a equatorial region, then, then it makes sense to eat those types of food or is it something longer? Is it multi-generational where you, you know, maybe your ancestors arrive from the tropics and, and therefore they're better suited to handle that. Or is it just a current state of the moment type of thing? Um, well, we are, we, we all supposedly, uh, moved from uh, Central Africa. We, that's where we originated from and we spread from there throughout the world. And so originally we all had the same kind of mitochondria. This is the work of um, Doug Wallace, who's at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, who's the, the absolute guru on, on all things mitochondria. He was the guy who proved that we um, inherit our mitochondria from our mothers. Mitochondria have their own DNA. So we have a, a, a cell which is DNA from your father, DNA from your mother, and the mitochondria, which run the energy programs in the, in the cell, are entirely from your maternal um, side of the family. And so <clears throat> he's traced back different types of DNA, different types of mitochondrial DNA, um, and it's shown that the mitochondria change. Mitochondria are they're a, basically a bacteria which we somehow um, took capture millions of years ago during our evolution. And so the mitochondrial DNA is, is simplified compared to our own, and it mutates much more rapidly than nuclear DNA, like thousands of times more rapidly. And so we're able to change our mitochondria according to the conditions that we find them, we find them in. So as we migrated out of Africa, and we put ourselves in different light environments, different temperature environments, and different food environments, um, we adapted our mitochondria to function in those environments. Um, and these adaptions, in some cases, may be seen as a, they, they may not work, and we may, uh, and that particular race of people may die out because they, they, their mitochondria has failed to adapt. They adapted in a way which led them to die out. But we can assume that the people that are around today, <coughs> excuse me, living in the, all these different parts of the world, are their mitochondria. I'm, I'm from this area, so technically speaking, my mitochondria are adapted to function here with extreme light stress. We have very, very long days in the summer. We have almost no, uh, it's not quite like the North, North Pole, but we only have probably four or five hours of darkness in the summer. Then in the winter, we probably only have four or five hours of daylight. So that's, a, that's quite an extreme light stress to put your body under. Um, and so... If I were to move to the equator, I could adapt to living on the equator, at which point I would be perfectly happy eating fruit all year round, assuming I'm living pretty much naked outdoors, barefoot in the sunshine. I would be perfectly able to adapt quite quickly to an all sugar diet, which is what in tropical areas, sugar, a bit of fish, you know, nothing to... Uh, apparently not terribly nutritional, nutritious because I'd be getting the vast majority of my energy from the sun because our bodies have the ability to generate ATP using sunlight alone. We're kind of effectively, we can be solar powered beings. Uh, in this part of the world, I would struggle to generate enough ATP using the sun alone. So I need to use more foodstuffs to generate my own heat to survive in this area. So my mitochondria here need to be what's called uncoupled so my mitochondria leak more of the energy flow rather than allowing it to go all the way through to atp i release some of the energy flow that's created in my mitochondria to create and release heat keep myself warm whereas someone on the, on the equator doesn't need to do that so people in uh, people who have equatorial DNA, mitochondrial dna have more closely coupled mitochondria um which are more designed to produce actual sort of physical power and physical work and they're less concerned with being able to produce heat, which is why you get a difference in athletes from different zones.
Let me ask you, I mean, you know, you talked about, you know, the mitochondria coming from, from the maternal side and there's a, the concept of the genetic Eve, you know, from the Adam and Eve theory that they're, they're, they've sort of identified this woman who maybe, I think maybe from Ethiopia from mm -hmm. a couple hundred thousand years ago was the mother of all homo sapiens, so on to speak. What role does temperature have on this sort of thing? You know, when we talk about the, the equator now, we, we associate with hot tropical environments, but as we look back into the human evolution, we know that in that time frame, it was it was much colder. I mean, we spent much of that time in ice ages where the average Earth's temperature was six to eight degrees Celsius cooler. So does, outside of latitude, does temperature, ambient temperature play any role in this? Because we know we, you're talking about heat generation. So my suspicion is temperature plays some role. What, what, what role does temperature have in this stuff? Uh, temperature's involved, it's less, significant than the the light that uh, hits your skin so that the light and the the intensity of the light um, and the the amount of ultraviolet in the in the sunlight is the, the single biggest driving factor I would say temperature is another input which your body uses to measure where you are and to make appropriate adjustments and, and uh, fine tuning of the mitochondria to, to, to produce the right form of energy for what you need and so we have um, if you're if you're in a colder environment, you need to have. If you take someone from the equator, for example, and you bring them, uh, as an example, in 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 the states, you you have a lot of people living in Chicago who were probably originally born in Somalia. Um, so they have equatorial mitochondrial DNA. They need strong sunlight, and they don't do well in cold temperatures, because their mitochondria are not structured to release heat. They're structured to just have a pretty perfect flow of energy throughout the whole mitochondrial chain. So you then, you then begin to get problems with the, those people begin to suffer diseases. Um, as you see in, in, in a lot of the, the black communities in the U S where they're in quite high latitudes, they're a long way from their mitochondrial home. Um, and it, it's not an instantaneous adjustment. If you're going from a low stress light environment on the equator, to a high stress, um, to a high stress environment. Excuse me, one second. I just have to let my daughter in the house. One second. Jack, We're not the only ones with uh, with the dog. External. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so interesting. Um, you know, I want to ask. Well, I'll get back when he, when he comes back. I'll ask him. Sorry about that. <laughs> So, no so Graham, I want to I want to yeah. just I want to ask another question if that's okay. So, you know, when you go back to saying that humans can be solar powered, you know, uh, and, and you you start thinking about these breatharians who just don't eat anything, suppose when they can live, uh, maybe running around naked in the sunshine in, in Ecuador or something like that. Um, my I find a hard time saying that a human could live completely without food. I mean, maybe you're suggesting that the more sun you have, the less food you might need to eat. And perhaps these people that come from equatorial Africa or wherever can get by on less calories because they're getting some of their energy creation from the sun, perhaps. Uh, maybe there's some, some merit to that. And maybe the fact that they moved to the United States and all of a sudden they need more calories to deal with the lack of sunlight. And then they do that cal caloric increase. Their body's not well adapted to it. And then they develop diabetes, heart disease, whatever, so on and so forth. I mean, that's just maybe a wild speculation, but can you, can you touch on that a little bit more? Um, yes, I think the, um, the statistic is something like, if you take all the ATP that your body produces in a given day, we produce slightly over our entire body weight every day in ATP. If you were to weigh every single molecule of ATP that you produce, right? Um, and I have seen studies that estimate that 70%, roughly two thirds of that can be and should be probably produced via sunlight and sunlight alone. And so in an ideal world, it seems that, um, if we're fully sun exposed in the right place and we're barefoot and everything, we're outside and everything's perfect. And there's no Wi-Fi and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and our cells are running perfectly. We should be generating about two thirds of energy from the sun and about one third from food. 
in terms of measuring it in terms of ATP. And obviously in the modern world, due to clothing, living indoors, glass, offices, windows, cars, all that sort of thing, our sun exposure is way below what it would have been ancestrally where we would have been bollock naked walking around on, on the plains. And so we now have to generate far more of our ATP using food which is a relatively speaking dirtier fuel compared to using sunlight. So we end up with byproducts of having to use the food. We end up with <clears throat> um, more reactive oxygen species created in the mitochondria because we're throwing in all these different foods. If we get the food right, if the food perfectly matches the environment that we're in, and our mitochondria have enough inputs to make all the right fine tuning and adjustments and they're running absolutely 100%, then we use the food cleanly and smoothly and we don't create too many reactive oxygen species, we don't create too much damage and everything runs fine. But if we are disconnected from our environment and we are just eating random foods because we think we should eat this, we think because our brain tells us that this is a good thing and we've read something about it, then we're not necessarily taking in the correct food for our environment. So I like the idea of the whole seasonal eating, seasonal eating based on where you are on the planet, not based on simply the season that you're in. So it's very much seasonal eating, locally based eating. So whatever is available around here. Um, and I'm surrounded by livestock. There's very little grows here, uh, lots of hills, lots of uh, very, very, small soil depth so we have no arable very little vegetable growth around here um the majority is it's it's fish in the lakes and um livestock on the hillsides around here ancestrally i'd be eating pretty much a carnivore diet which kind of works for me around living around here yeah so yeah i was going to wonder about how you you know how you set that if there's a mismatch you know and obviously with the modern food system i can get avocados year round. I mean, this is, this is a, the sort of the, what, what the situation we, we are in and perhaps, and I, I do find the concept that, that saying that food is a relatively dirty form of energy relative to direct ATP, ATP generation via, via things like sunlight. I think that's an interesting concept. Um, so how does, I mean, how do we, I mean, just in general terms, with regard to just food, and then we can touch on water and magnetism in a sec, because I want to get into those topics. But, how do we generally sort out our diet, you know, if we're, if we're using this theory that light, you know, photosensitivity, uh, you know, uh, you know, we've got chemotaxis, phototaxis in, in, in primitive organisms. How do we sort that out for our diet? I mean, obviously, I live in California. So, I mean, the latitude is, is far farther south than where you are in, in the north of England. But how does, how does the average person sort of say, I mean, you know, what I'm supposed to eat. And then, and then how do we justify, you know, again, we have to say, if we're using an evolutionary model, what was California like a hundred thousand years ago? I mean, does that have any in play or, or is it just what we are in experience today? What's local to us? How, how do you sort that out? I think what's, I mean, obviously what's local to me, I, I could go down to the supermarket and I could buy a banana. Um, so, but that's not locally grown. So you've got to look at something. Um, I, I think you look at what is available in your environment or would have been available in your, in your environment a few hundred years ago. Um, and if you eat that, I mean, if you can grow pineapples where you're, where you're living, if you can pick them from the end of your garden, there should be no issue in you eating a pineapple, assuming you have got sufficient sun exposure on naked skin during the day. I think the issue with with, uh, with foods is the if you eat meats and fats, proteins and fats, they are processed through the mitochondria via different cytochromes. The the various electrons and protons from the food breakdown go into cytochrome two, cytochrome three, whereas the higher powered carbohydrates, summer foods, uh, which release the ultraviolet photons, which are much higher energy and, and actually have the ability to cause more damage. They have more power, but they can cause more damage to the system. They get uh, processed in cytochrome one, as I'm sure you know. 
So what I think we, we need the, you have to take, take it the other way. I think the, the sunlight exposure that you get switches your mitochondria or, or causes your mitochondria to, to structure themselves in such a way that they are able to handle a certain type of food. So if you're in a high ultraviolet exposure area and you get lots of time outdoors in the summer, your mitochondria will be preset to be able to handle the higher powered photons from the carbohydrate summer foods. If you're in a lower light environment that I'm in now, my mitochondria are set for the low light. So they're not expecting summer food to be thrown in the mix. So it's almost like you've, you've got an engine which is kind of set up to run on diesel and you try to force it to run on gasoline. Uh, it's going to damage the engine. Whereas if you modify the engine using the power of ultraviolet light and you make some modifications to your engine and you set it up to run on gasoline, then you can throw in some summer foods, which are your higher powered um, carbohydrate summer foods. So it's a, it's the light environment that drives your ability to handle different foods. And if you're in a poor light environment, then to play safe, you go down the list of power and you go into protein and fat, which are much easier to process and cause less stress on the system because they come in further down the mitochondrial respiratory chain. Now for a word from our sponsors. All right, folks, this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast is brought to you by ButcherBox. ButcherBox offers you convenience by delivering your meat right to your door with free shipping. They also offer quality by having options such as 100% grass-fed and grass-finished beef, heritage breed pork, and free-range chicken. They also offer value with their goal to make clean meat accessible to as many people as possible by partnering with a collective of small farms. They are able to deliver you the best products for less than $6 per meal. They often run promos on their website for subscribers to get things like free pork or free bacon. If you enter promo code HPO at checkout, you can also knock an additional $20 off your first subscription. So head over to butcherbox.com and place your first order. Now back to the show. You know, I've, uh, I want let's, let's transition over to water because I mean, you, you know, you mentioned that at the beginning. I mean, obviously food, I mean, there's water and food. I mean, if we look at like beef and, and, and it, for, for instance, 70% of it's water. I mean, much of the plant food has got water in it. Um, I mean, it's an interesting fact, most people know that most of the water that cows consume comes from the grass they eat. Uh, it's just the vast majority of the water that they get. So talk to us a little bit about water. Water is, um, it represents about 70% of the Earth's surface. It also represents approximately 70% of human beings by weight. Um, interestingly, water is a very, very small molecule. And so if you look at human beings' makeup, we are 99.9% .9 water by number of molecules. Which means that every single part of your body is in contact with water molecules. So there is water in and amongst every single thing. Um, and water is something which in medicine, certainly in traditional medical training for the last hundred years, water is something which is ignored, considered to be neutral, considered to be inactive, and it's simply a solvent, and it's something that you need to keep yourself hydrated. There's, there's no understanding in, in current medical um, opinion that water has any active role to play in body energetics. Whereas the work of Gerald Pollock would suggest that charge separation of water, when water is split into its OH negative and its H positive um, components, 
which occurs automatically with no energy input. If you, if you put water in a confined space close to a hydrophilic surface, and all proteins are hydrophilic. So in our body, all collagen can be considered as hydrophilic. So every single point where these 99.9% .9 water molecules are in contact with a hydrophilic surface in your body, charge separation of water occurs naturally. And you get what um, Gerald Pollock described as an exclusion zone, which excludes everything down to the size of a hydrogen proton. So you end up with positively charged end of the water molecule in one area and the negatively charged in another area, another area. So you have created naturally, this is like self-assembly in the human body, with no energy input, you've charged separated water. You've created a capacitor. It's the same water, but it's just structured itself naturally due to the hydrophilic nature of the protein. You then take light and you shine light on that water. And if you shine red light on that water, infrared light on that water, the exclusion zone becomes larger, i.e. more of the water charge separates. You have a bigger potential of positive and negative charges which have been separated. So you've added energy. The water has been able to absorb the energy from the light and capture it in a capacitor which can then be released again. So if you structure the water by shining infrared light on it, that water has captured energy. If you then allow that water to destructure, it will release the energy that it captured, and that energy can be used in the cell for various cell processes. If you then take this water, which has been structured once by the shining of infrared light on it, it's then found that that water is particularly susceptible to input from ultraviolet light, which is higher energy. So the water bonds have changed because of the, the uh, structuring driven by the infrared light, creates a different phase. You then shine ultraviolet light on it. In fact, ultraviolet C is the frequency which uh, is, it, it, it absorbs the most. That cell water is then able to absorb the energy from ultraviolet C, then restructures and charge separates dramatically. So we can then absorb massive quantities of energy from the ultraviolet light from the sun, which creates an even bigger battery and an even bigger powerhouse in our cells. So if we follow those processes, if we, have, we consume decent water that doesn't have any fluoride in it, we expose ourselves to infrared light, either from the sun or from our own personal generating, generation of heat. We create structured water within our mitochondria, which can then make use of incident ultraviolet light, which has very high energy, creating a very, very high individual capacitor in every one of our mitochondria, which gives you this massive um, storage of instantly available energy which is available for every single biochemical process that you'd like to take that you would like to happen in in any given cell or mitochondria at any given time this is this comes from the work of um gilbert ling who um he was criticizing or he was critiquing the work of i think it was mitchell that was talking about the um uh, the cell cycle and how the energy works and how energy flows through a cell and pumps and calcium and sodium pumps and all this stuff. And Gilbert Ling looked at his work and said that the the energy that's required for all these processes that have Mitchell had uh, Mitchell won the Nobel Prize for this. Uh, but Ling later said the energy flow does not make sense. There isn't sufficient energy present in the system to explain all these processes that you've, that you've um, discussed. Gilbert Ling was the one that, that described it as being the energy comes from within the water. Um, and so that's where water in our body is incredibly important. It's there to, it, it acts as a sort of electromagnetic sponge. It's able to absorb electromagnetic frequencies in a very efficient and very ordered way and to instantaneously release them or reabsorb them. So it acts as the intermediate transmitter of energy from one place to another.
And so that's, that's something that medicine currently doesn't look into. Quantum biology, which is a sort of nascent area of, of, of um, biology, let's say it's, a, it's an outgrowth of biology. Um, it's also called biophysics. These are two very, very small areas of, of science. It's, and it's been driven by physicists who have become rather bored doing experiments on inanimate objects, and they've decided that what's, what could be more interesting than human beings or living organisms, and so they're, they're applying quantum physics to biochemical processes, and they're having much more success at thoroughly explaining how the energy flows can work through a, through a, um, a, a living organism. So those are two areas that are fascinating. Uh, quantum biology and, and, and uh, also known as biophysics, which is basically how light and water and magnetism interact in a living system. So if we can just kind of back up for one second real quick, because if we look at what we were talking before with like the sunlight being kind of like a, a solar energy generator, and uh, if you let's say you took like a human and you expose them to like a lot of sun exposure to bare skin, like well above and beyond what they would normally get, is that person then gonna be requiring less of less food intake because of that additional sun exposure, or how does that interact? Or is it more of a is there an energy output increase that's assumed within that kind of equation too that keeps things? more relative or, or more consistent, I guess, on how much food is being consumed in that environment? Um, in the example you gave, if, if, you're, if you're getting more sun exposure, you will require less food. Uh, and another way of, way of trying this out would be, if you want to try fasting, you'll find fasting much, much easier if you're in full sun exposure during the time. Yeah, you know, the, the closest I've gotten to seeing anything like that would be, I guess, just relative uh, reduced hunger when exposed to heat, which I guess would be most likely going to be happening in sun exposure. Um, yeah, do, is, there, is there any, like, uh, research or anything done that shows, like, I guess, more or less... Uh, what is like well, what what the reduction would be or the increase versus for someone like say sitting in dark all day versus someone being out in the sun all day um i haven't seen it put in in such sort of easy to understand terms there's there's a lot of work explaining the how the process works um and it in it works really within the mitochondria and that it it basically shuts down the if you have a, a, a large amount of ultraviolet hitting your body, it effectively shuts down um, the food inputs into your mitochondria. So you simply do not use food. Um, so you will find fasting more fasting easier, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to lose any weight because you're taking in the, the light to generate the energy. It doesn't mean that you're burning food to generate the energy. So you would find fasting more simple and straightforward and, and far less stressful, but you wouldn't necessarily see the weight loss benefits of the fasting. Is there, Graham, I wonder if there's any relationship between, you know, light sensing in the skin and regulation of other hormones, which would, which would drive appetite. You know, maybe some people would point to things like leptin and ghrelin if there's a relationship to that. And could you say that, you know, maybe I can go, spend some time in the sun, get a tan, and I won't be as hungry, you know, as, you know, and, and again, you know, maybe, maybe you don't lose weight. Maybe the optimal mass strategy for losing weight is fasting and not getting any sun exposure, <laughs> no, but it, but it makes a horrible experience. But do, is there any known relationship between sun exposure and impact on appetite regulation through any hormone systems that we're aware of? Um, yeah, I would say that the, um, pretty much our entire hormonal system is driven by sunlight um, and specifically what's designed to occur is that at sunrise we're designed to expose ourselves specifically our eyes to the sunrise and uh, the sun has zero ultraviolet light in it at, at sunrise well the sun's the same the sun's the same all day long but it's the amount of ultraviolet 
that reaches the surface of the Earth is zero at sunrise and zero at sunset, and it peaks in the middle of the day due to the smaller amount of atmosphere that the, that the sunlight has to come through. So the, the um, process is supposed to be your eye receives sunlight, which is red, infrared, green and blue at sunrise. The blue is the trigger, which is designed to switch on your pituitary to produce the hormones that you're going to need for that day based on the conditions that your body senses. The red light, which is always present in the sun, is designed to provide the energy to create those, those hormones and to repair any damage which is done from the stimulatory blue light. So blue alone, a lot of people use these wake-up lights, these uh, lights, uh, what they call them, sad lights. It's like a blue, th it's a, a white light which wakes you up in the morning. Um, they sound like a great idea because they provide the blue stimulus that you wouldn't get because you're not seeing the sunlight. The problem is they lack the uh, red and the infrared. So you're providing a stimulus, um, an inflammatory stimulus to your body, which switches on um, your pituitary, but you're not providing the energy input using the infrared, not getting any red or infrared from the sun. So the hormone production is supposed to be switched on in the mornings by the pituitary, by a blue light making its way to the pituitary. And then later in the morning, when your skin senses ultraviolet light, we have neuropsin and we have melanopsin, which are two opsins which are present in the skin. Um, the activation of the neuropsin when it's hit by ultraviolet A light sometime in the mid-morning is supposed to switch off this hormone production process in the pituitary. And at night time, uh, during the day, in your eye and your skin, when it's hit by ultraviolet light, the melanopsin in your eye is used to generate dopamine, it's used to generate ocular melatonin, and then when the absence of blue light takes effect after, sun, after sunset, the hormones of nighttime, melatonin, is then released from the pineal and then begins to act throughout the body over the next several hours, which then triggers uh, the, the... Then it coincides with the release of leptin from your fat cells, which tends to occur around midnight, again, assuming the absence of light for the last three or four hours the leptin makes its way around to the hypothalamus where there's a leptin sensor the leptin sensor is designed to count the electrons and the energy component of the of those electrons so it's not just how much fat you have it's how activated that fat has been via light during the day this is a very complex process which hasn't been clearly uh, defined. This is a little bit of a grey area. How does the body measure its available energy resources? It's believed to use leptin and the leptin receptor around midnight, assuming you haven't eaten and you haven't been exposed to blue light for the last three or four hours. If you get that right and you're, you're, leptin, you're leptin sensitive in the first place, you're able to release your leptin from your fat cells and you're, it's able to make its way into, into the hypothalamus, your body can then have a pretty good guess as to how much energy you have stored, how much you've been using and how much energy from the sun has been coming in. It can then, during the night time, make adjustments, burn off extra fat, so you, you will actually burn fat while you sleep as free heat, um, and it will make adjustments to the mitochondria, repair damage, et cetera, et cetera. And it releases uh, prolactin, it releases um, uh, growth hormone. So light is the driving force for a whole series of, of hormonal releases throughout the day. Graham, just, just to kind of a, uh, maybe a little bit off topic, but I mean, we often hear you know, deuterium sort of espoused sort of in the same field. Does light have an impact on the deuterium molecule, which is basically a hydrogen atom. It's got, it's a heavy hydrogen atom. It's got an extra proton in it. But 
is there any relationship between light and, and deuterium? I don't know if you can comment on that. Yeah, deuterium is a topic which kind of burst onto the scene a couple of years ago, and then lots of people started to make noise about it. It's kind of gone a bit quiet ever since. Uh, deuterium is an interesting one. And again, the science is, uh, it, it's difficult to get, to the original source that there, there appears to be only one or two people commenting on it in any great detail. Um, it seems that we are designed to use water in our cells, which has very, very little deuterium in it, specifically in our, in our mitochondria. The suggestion is that, uh, the ATPase is driven the rotor in our mitochondria, which is driven by the flow of hydrogen protons. And there is a suggestion that if you have deuterium in that, in that space, instead of a, a hydrogen proton, you have a deuterium with, with its extra neutron. It doesn't fit, physically fit through the ATPase rotor, and it can block it or damage it, reducing the production of ATP. And so our bodies have systems which are designed to detect deuterium and designed to put deuterium where it should be and to keep it away from areas where it shouldn't be. So deuterium is unusual in that it's molecularly very similar to, to water. And in terms of biochemistry, you'd notice very little difference if you were using heavy water or light water uh, in your experiments. But at the sort of nanoscopic level of our, of our cellular machinery, the deuterium becomes quite significant. And so um, we, our bodies use it as a kind of, almost like a sensor when we have larger amounts of, of um, deuterium that can be detected by the body. And when we, ha when we have less, that can also be detected. So it's a, it's a variable that our body is able to play with. The, the fundamental difference between regular hydrogen protons and deuterium protons are that they have a different magnetic moment. They respond differently to magnetic fields. And so the way that our body is able to differentiate them, for example, um, when you urinate, your body is primarily getting rid of excess deuterium water. So our kidneys use an electric charge to create electromagnetic field because that field acts differently on deuterium than it does on hydrogen, the liver, the, the kidney, sorry, is able to create the field which, uh, which will deflect a deuterium mo molecule in a different direction compared to a regular hydrogen molecule. So it's able to retain the hydrogens that it wants and it's able to kick out the deuterium in the urine. And so our bodies have all these systems. It's also used in DNA. Um, where deuterium is placed strategically in, within the DNA so that when an electromagnetic field is applied to the DNA, the deuterium responds in a different way to the other hydrogens, creating a trigger response. So it's, it's almost like an ability that, that we have to, to cause our DNA to switch on and off, which is driven electromagnetically. It's been discovered that mitochondrial energy flow which creates this flow of current when you have a flow of current you have a magnetic field and so the mitochondrial energy flow determines how tightly wound up the dna helix in the nuclear genome is so if mitochondrial energy flow becomes less the magnetic field which is keeping the spiral of the nuclear DNA tightly, tightly wrapped up, sort of slackens off, which allows more of the genome to express. And this is where we have the situation where people might have a gene, a nuclear gene, which predisposes them to a certain disease, but they might go on to live to 100 with no issues of that disease, even though they have the gene. But if their mitochondria begin to perform poorly, and the, the current of flow in the mitochondria drops, the magnetic field drops, the DNA unwraps because it's, less, it's being less tightly squeezed by the magnetic field. It unwraps, allowing these genes 
to begin to express. And so you then get, you might get a breast cancer gene expressing, or you might get genes which were not supposed to express, begin to express because it's the, the, the mitochondria is trying to, trying to find a gene within the nuclear genome that it can use to improve the power output. It's almost like a natural governor. You know, when, when the energy drops, you open a toolkit, which is your nuclear DNA, you use that toolkit to make some changes, and if it increases the output, everything goes back to normal, the DNA closes up, and everything's fine again until the NG drops. And then it opens up again, you use the toolkit, you make some changes. So we're designed to naturally sort of slightly open our DNA, use some of it to our benefit, and then move on. If it's not to our benefit, that mitochondria will... Uh, become defective and have to be replaced. It's kind of like an automatic repair program, which runs way below our level of perception, way below. We, we can't intervene in that apart from trying to give our body the best possible inputs so that it can do its own job. So it's kind of like an automatic self-tune that we have. Is there any, uh, you know, with, with the deuterium, is there any way that nutrition is impacted by deuterium or, or vice versa? Yeah, deuterium is, um, naturally, deuterium, um, deuterium is placed, if you, if you have a uh, high deuterium foods tend to be the carbohydrate foods which are grown in the, in the sunshine. So most sugars, most starchy carbohydrates, contain quite a high amount of deuterium. But the deuterium has been placed in specific places in the sugar using ultraviolet light as the, the guide. And so when our bodies break down those foodstuffs, the deuterium that's contained within them gets released. And we have a very complex process within our cell, within the TCA cycle, etc., to strip out the hydrogen, I believe they're called dehydrogenases, where, where the hydrogen from food is stripped out. And we have a very, very complex sort of fail-safe system, which is designed to take hydrogen from certain points on the sugar and not from other points on the sugar, because we're, we're assuming that the deuterium has been placed by nature in the right places. And then if, we, if we're living in a strong summer environment and we're eating these foods in summer, our cells are able to kind of dec decode the way that the sugar is structured and we're able to strip out the hydrogens and leave behind the deuterium in a separate area. So we're able to, to process it efficiently without putting the deuterium in the wrong places. So if you eat deuterium heavy foods, which tend to be the uh, seeds of plants, uh, the fruits, um, the eggs, things like that, um, the, the deuterium is quite a pro-growth um, story, so it tends to be found in in, uh, in, in seeds or in something that's that's going to have to grow and and, uh, and divide. Um, and so, if you eat those kind of foods and you're not getting sufficient ultraviolet light, the body's ability to separate and distinguish between hydrogen and deuterium is diminished. So you you would then end up with an overload or an excess of deuterium in places where you don't want it, which could be damaging to your mitochondria. This could then lead to your mitochondria beginning to perform poorly. You then get energy issues within your mitochondria. You then eventually might develop cancer, which is ultimately a lack of energy, um, lack of mitochondrial energy story, um, where, the, where the, the body starts to produce extra um, power plant because there's not enough energy being produced and it can't seem to repair the damage. Which is why um, deuterium depleted water has been used quite extensively, in, uh, especially in Eastern Europe, uh, the former Soviet Union, to, um, to treat cancer. Because if, if you, the, the theory being that if you drown yourself in, uh, by drinking plenty of water that's exceptionally low in deuterium, you can eventually flush out the deuterium molecules which are blocking up your mitochondria, thereby freeing them up to function correctly, thereby increasing their energy, 
causing the tumour to naturally shrink because the body then doesn't require the tumour growth to produce the energy because it's now got more efficient mitochondria. But there's some considerable work being done on that um, in, in, in Eastern Europe with, with what seems like pretty decent success. There's a, there's a good book about that, um, probably 20 years old now, but it's an excellent book on, on cancer and the use of deuterium depleted water in its treatment. Yeah, I know one advocate, I guess, is a guy fellow by the name of Laszlo Boris, who apparently had his yeah. own lung cancer resolve, I think, if, that, if, that, if I'm not mistaken. But let's talk a little bit about um, magnetism, because, I mean, we're, we live on a giant magnet. I mean, the, the Earth is, you know, it's got magnetic poles. And so how, do, how does magnetism affect our health? Magnetism's a, <clears throat> it's a very tricky one, because it's, it's something that, that very few people understand in any, de in any great detail. Um, I don't claim to be a magnetism expert. I'm aware that it's it's an important factor, but I struggle to fully understand it myself, and I therefore struggle even further to um, to explain it to, to anybody else. But I would uh, I would suggest that we have it's almost like you have a a, a fixed energy flow in the form of magnetism coming from the Earth. And our bodies are able to generate an electromagnetic field. We're able to generate a flow of electrons and we're able to generate a magnetic field around that flow of electrons. And we can then somehow use the magnetism from the earth to almost leverage on that flow. It's almost like one vector running this way and then the, the Earth's magnetic field runs another way and you can, you can use it as a lever, to, as a, almost as a fulcrum to, to kind of get different work done. Um, there's, there's also the issue of electron spin, which get, we're getting very complex in terms of, we've talked about electrons, we've talked about flows of electrons, we've talked about the light that, was originally used to create those electrons but you then get to a, another level of complexity where electrons have a different spin and that spin can be changed using magnetism and you can also take regular electrons you can take magnetism and you can create energy you can create movement of electrons using just the magnetism so it, it's called the uh, inverse Hall effect. It's a, it's a peculiar semiconductor story. So human beings have the ability to take the magnetic field from the Earth that interacts with the spin of our electron and it's able to release energy in some form and also it's able to change the spin of electrons which changes signaling. So it's, it's a very subtle and complex effect we are designed sense it it has always been present our bodies were designed our bodies evolved with the constant presence of magnetism and it's something that we we generally lack nowadays because it's blocked by plastics it's blocked by if the further you sleep off the ground uh, most people sleep in the upper part of the house most people's houses have some kind of petrochemical sheet which uh, like the damp proof uh, below the surface of the ground plastic of any sort petrochemical of any sort blocks the earth or reduces the earth's magnetic field so we are in the modern world significantly less exposed to the magnetic field the magnetic field of the earth itself has been gradually declining um, and we're also with the use of AC, electricity, Wi-Fi, mobile phone signals, we're creating a chaotic field in which our ability to sense this relatively subtle magnetic field from the Earth is greatly diminished. So it is a fundamental force that, that we require, we have required for our development. We can make use of it. We benefit um, when we reinstate the force. Uh, there's... Um, there's a company out of somewhere in, they're, they're somewhere in California, the Magnetico, I don't know where you've come across them, Magnetico mattresses. It's a, a sort of thing that you put under your mattress, which contains um, individual 
um, very, very strong magnets, which create a north-south pole, totally static, north-south magnetic field, totally static in your mattress, which penetrates your body, which is designed to replicate the, magnet, the static magnetic field um, of the Earth while you sleep. And some people have had very, very tremendous tremendous benefits health-wise from sleeping on those to, to reinstate the magnetism you would normally benefit from at night. Magnetism is important at night time more than anything else. Night time in the absence of sunlight is when it would historically uh, have been stronger, when it is stronger, um, and it has effects on cells. It does, have a, it does affect um, um, cortisol, for example. One of the reasons you wake up in the morning is not just the sunlight um, triggering you to wake up that the rising magnetism rises during the night it begins to fall again when the sun rises so when your body senses a fall in magnetism it tends to release cortisol which is part of your waking up process so magnetism is involved it is very complex and i don't consider myself truly capable of explaining how it works Yeah, I mean, I guess one just kind of interesting, and I don't know how impactful this is, but we know that the Earth's magnetic field flips every periodically throughout the history of the Earth. And so I just wonder if, you know, maybe if we have a magnetic flip, I'll have to go vegan or something. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Hey, uh, you know, this is a very interesting stuff. Hey, Graham, can you just, I mean, maybe just spend, you know, a couple minutes just sort of putting things in sort of an actionable plan? Because there's a lot of, you know, very fundamental, basic, you know, molecular level, atomic level theory going on, and it's hard for someone to conceptualize, what do I do? How do I put that into action if, if it's truly affecting us? I mean, is there, is there something you can say on how to generally deal with all these issues uh, to, to maybe use them to our benefit? Yeah, first of all, I would say you don't need to understand all the details. Your body is designed to do this automatically. It, it is it's absolutely a requirement that our bodies are able to do this. Um, we have trillions of mitochondria that sense these changes throughout the day, throughout the seasons, um, and so it's automatic. But it's automatic based on how we lived ancestrally, how we evolved. And so the best way to do this is to trust that your body has this under control. If you give your body the purest inputs from an ancestral viewpoint, your body will sort itself out and it will do what's required. And so what you're doing is this, this is Phil Escott's kind of theory is it's the, the subtraction method. Try to consider your daily life and look at what you have now that an ancestral human being didn't experience. And so strip those things away and of those things, lighting and electricity and electrical gadgets in general are the key component. So get your light right and everything else will begin to fall into place which means we should be seeing the sunrise. We should be exposing our eyes to the sunrise. We should be exposed to sunlight as much as possible throughout the day on our eyes and skin. Sunrise is the key, close to sunrise. It, little bits of sunrise exposure during the day, as much as you, as you can manage in the modern world, um, take regular breaks from your office or whatever and go outside and, and, and get yourself exposed to the sun. And then in the evenings, when this, try to watch the sunset, that's also very beneficial. Um, and then after the sun sets, be really quite strict in blocking blue light and your, try to limit your use of electrical devices, certainly wireless devices, after dark. If you do that as a fundamental baseline and you drink decent water and you eat local seasonal food for your location on earth, 
during the daytime, your body will pretty much take care of the rest. And you find it, yeah, you, as long as you have a decent, quiet place to sleep, um, that's ideally not disturbed by lots of Wi-Fi from the neighbors, etc. then you don't need to worry about what's going on under the hood. It will sort itself out. Um, but it's easier said than done. But yeah, in the modern world, it's a much it's easier said than done. But get as much morning sunlight exposure on your eyes and skin as possible, and have as little electrical or light artificial light after dark. Those two fundamental things are, are the the simple things to do. Just try to try to make your life as close as possible to the ancestral life as best as you can within your modern life it would be my overall advice and don't worry too much about how it all works because it will all, it will if you do that it will fix itself your body will adjust itself and you'll find the you'll find the sweet spot very interesting stuff i, I really appreciate the education graham uh, I, again i look forward to meeting you in person in may zach any other stuff we've we've, we've kind of got through quite a bit of material here yeah, no, it's all, all very interesting. I think uh, especially the, the light stuff, I think, is uh, you know, something I hadn't given a whole lot of thought to outside of the circadian rhythm side of things. So, you know, hopefully it'd be cool to see some studies with that where if we can recognize like what type of contribution, like a, a, a really sizable amount of sun exposure versus very little or no would do to something like your metabolic output or uh, metabolic input needs and things like that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting stuff. So hopefully more, more energy gets put into this down the road too. Yeah. I mean, it, if you, if you look at the modern human, the, the absence of sunlight and the excess of artificial light is it's absolutely off the chart. Mm -hmm. And I mean, in the last hundred years, if you consider how much, how little time we now spend outdoors, and how much time we spend in a totally artificially blue lit environment. It's, it's stunning. It's absolutely stunning. Yeah. And that I believe is, is the most significant driver to our ill health that we've, that we've had in the last hundred years. Yeah. I mean, I, I personally, I have no doubt that, that, that our, that our light, sort of exposure is, is not consistent with what we did. I, I you know, I, I don't know how much I would say that that is the number one driver of all health disease. It may be, I mean, I, I mean, I'd, I'd like to see us sort of prove that, but I mean, I certainly can see where that is an impact. I think, you know, like for me, I think nutrition has a huge role and it may, there may be some overlap, you know, as you talk about how light affects nutrition and, and the food mismatches between that. And so um, I think, you know, you can't, I mean, you've got to eat. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I mean, so you've got, you've got to, you've got to get this in, but if light affects the mismatch of food, then, then maybe there's more to it than, than that. But um, interesting, very interesting stuff. Very, very uh, uh, sort of uh, provocative uh, thinking about this stuff. But, but anyway, Graham, let people know where they might be able to find more of your, your information if you care to do so, or where they can find you if you're on social media or you have any other, ways for people to find more about this stuff uh yeah sure i'm um on social media i'm not terribly active i'm on uh, i can be found on facebook um i am also uh, as i mentioned earlier I'm, I'm part of a of a project called the human unleashed is the human unleashed.com that's myself and three colleagues um we have some free stuff up there explaining what we're up to um, and that, that's a good place to get hold of uh, myself, Phil Escott, and, and uh, the other guys. Um, and uh, most of my discussion today related to, to light comes from the work of, of Jack Cruz, which itself comes from the work of several other people. And he's definitely worth uh, worth looking into. Um, he's got loads of free stuff up there and uh, lots of talks online you can find. So if you want to go into the real nitty gritty of the, of the light, uh, and its effect on health. He he's the go-to guy without question. Um, but uh, that's that's about uh, that's about the situation. I agree with you on the food, though. I think I find it a difficult sell to to persuade people that 
they will be helped by just changing their light. It's quite difficult to persuade them to do it. If you persuade them to change their diet, like switching to carnivore, they then tend to improve quite quickly and their brain function improves quickly and they can then become more open to discussing things such as light and then making further changes which fine tune their situation. So although I believe light is the primary driver, it's so hard to get people to see that, that they are not willing to make the changes. The food is a food, especially carnivory seems to be a quick way in to people. And it's something they can tangibly change very easily. Uh, and then they go on to, to want to make more changes and looking to think more deeply and light crops up as, as one of the, uh, of the things plus. Which is yeah, I mean, some people will say taking, you know, swallowing the red pill, and then you've got your brain opens up to some other things. And, and it very well be that light affects food, and then, and then you know, you're by, indirectly by switching diet, you're, you're actually changing your light exposure, so to speak. Yeah, well, you're certainly, if you're, if you're switching from a, a, a typical sad diet to a carnivorous diet, you're removing the stressful, high-energy ultraviolet foods from your diet. And assuming that your light, as we've said, most people's light exposure is bad. They're lacking the, the sunlight, the ultraviolet exposure. And you need the sunlight exposure to be able to deal with the high energy food. So if you, if, you're, if you assume everyone's in a poor light environment and you then take away the ultraviolet foods and you just stick to the meat and the fat, you've already taken away an enormous amount of stress from the body. Uh, but it, it can be explained using light as the, as the analogy, as the, the underlying driver. Well, interesting, interesting stuff, Graham. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, Zach, I think we, we, we can call this another successful podcast. I'm sure our listeners will be excited to hear this. And uh, again, like I said, I look forward to meeting you in the, in the, in the spring. Thank awesome. You. Yeah. Thanks for coming on, Graham. We'll, we'll link some of the stuff you mentioned to the show notes and, uh, I'll let you know when it's ready to go. Excellent. Thank you very much. Hey, folks. Human Performance Outliers podcast is growing. And due to the growth, we are looking to take on some new sponsors. So if you feel like your company or organization would be a good fit for our audience, please do not hesitate to reach out to hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. If you enjoyed the show, please consider following us on social media and checking out our websites. Links to those can be found in the show notes. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to shoot us an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning into the show.